Thank you so much for doing nice this. Nice being here. This is, um, I saw you do the, the, the National with Peter last night, uh, a taped interview, and, and, and one thing in the States I'd seen that was a taped interview. This is your first live interview, interview you've done for the book. You're someone who's known for not doing many interviews. How do you feel about the prospect of doing this now? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's something I must do. <laughs> As I said to a friend of mine, uh, you know, I'd rather have a root canal. <laughs> no, uh, hey, it's part of the part of what I ha you have to do, and I'm uh, I'm ready for it. It's uh, uh, the process has been fun. Uh, uh, it was great to go back and remember the old days and many friends, many people who helped me along the way and. Uh, through hockey, the many people I met. So it, it, it's been fun. What is it about uh, this, the, the, the interview or the public stuff that you don't... I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you've been... Since you were a kid, people yeah. wanted to talk to you, and that's part of the... That just gets annoying after a while? Is no, it's not not being annoying. I just... I'm not a, a, a camera or a mic guy. I just... I never have been. Uh, I'm not comfortable uh, in front of a mic or a camera, and that's just the way I've been. It, it, Reading your book, it, it seems that this experience of writing it was uh, cathartic for you. It, it felt like it was a time to get um, both explore yeah. your own story and to get some th yeah. some things off your chest. You know, I just there's been a lot of books written. I've I've been approached many times about doing one, and I just I I just wasn't ready to do it. I I didn't want to do a book just to do a book. Uh, if I was going to do a book, I wanted to make sure it was something that. Uh, so, uh, everyone that might read it will take something from it. And, uh, you know, my, my friend Vern Stanley, who wrote the book with me, um, you know, we, when I decided I wanted to do a book, we took, gosh, at least eight months uh, putting it together, wondering where I'm going to go, is, is, is it going to be interesting, uh, uh, what's a, what should the sections be? So before we went to a publisher, we, we, we were about eight months uh, trying to, decide uh will it be interesting <laughs> uh will people be able to get something from it with it yeah what, what do you have to work with will it be interesting <laughs> but bobby w was there a precipitant was there something in particular with the change for you where you said okay i'm ready to write this no, thing I'm, you know i'm I'll, I'll be 66 this year uh you know i gotta i have a couple of grandchildren i just you know i just thought it was time i i have some thoughts and opinions uh i i, I hope if it's an up-and-coming player a parent with a that that next one, uh, uh, the the pros. I mean, keeping that love and passion for the game, and everyone involved in our game to make sure that they understand we all have a responsibility to keep our our game great. And uh, and I think that was the reason I did it. I think there's a little bit in there for everyone, and, uh, and I hope they take something from it. I find it a really compelling book. You, well, thank you, you. You, you didn't. You've said that you didn't spend much time reading what was written about you no. during your career, or even afterwards. What was it like to sit down and and write an anal analytical book about yourself. It, it wasn't an easy process for me. I mean, I, it's not the way I am. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just not the way I am. So it was difficult. And uh, with Vern and, and their, our publishers, they, they had to do a lot of pulling. Uh, but I wanted to write it, uh, have it written in my words, not, not theirs. And, and, and I, think, I think that's how it's come out. And I'm, uh, I can't tell. Uh, with my work, if it's any good, uh, I'm getting pretty good feedback from. But they're my friends, so I don't think they're no, going to criticize it, it me. It feels so, very honest. Well, I, I tried to be honest, uh, and I hope, and I think there are some uh, some points in there, some some things that everyone can take and and, and maybe be better. Let me start from the uh, get into the book now, and and start from the cover. The cover is this famous image of you, the the flying Bobby Orr photo, uh, capturing the moment you scored the winning goal in the nineteen seventy Stanley Cup final. It's probably the one of the great sports images of all time. Uh, you've lived with this for for many years. Uh, there's a in the story in the book about the first time you saw it was actually the next you know when it came morning. to the paper the next day. Uh, what goes through your mind when you look at that photo now? Obviously, it was a it was. It was a wonderful time, you know, like all young Canadian boys, your dream is to play in the NHL and then be on a Stanley Cup team. So that was our, the Stanley Cup uh, uh, winning goal. So obviously I'm thrilled. But, the, you know, it's a statue out in front of Boston Garden now, our TD Centre now. Um, and where I'm, I'm thrilled to be there, but it, when, when I look at it, it's much more uh, than me scoring a goal. It's one goal, one moment. I mean, when the day we un it was unveiled, uh, uh, you know, Kathy Bailey was sitting there, Ace Bailey, who was a teammate who was, who was killed in 9-11. I mean, I thought about Ace. Uh, you think about Mel Schmidt, the great 
great Mel Schmidt, who, who made the deal really to that put us over the top when Esposito, Hodge, and Stanfield <laughs> came to Boston. And then, you know, Derek Sanderson was coming and Donnie Marcotte was coming. Johnny Busick was there. McKenzie was there. Uh, Teddy Green was there. Westfall was there. So Cheevers, Johnson. So when I look at that statue, I think about all the pieces that were put together for, to, to, uh, in order to have that statue there for that uh, Stanley Cup team. But it's, it's a lot more than just that one moment. Uh, well, it's also, uh, and you talk about this in the book, and, and you've, you've, you mentioned it a couple of times now as well. I, I saw it last night on the, uh, with Peter on the National. You, uh, ever since I was a kid, I've known this, this image, and, this, and, and then I started seeing the video and stuff, and, and the whole idea was, man, Bobby Orr was getting tripped, and he scored the goal <laughs> to win the Stanley Cup, right? And you are sort of getting tripped, but at the same time, oh, you're I, in celebration I mode, I right? Helped. You're I jumping was, up and... I was in celebration mode. The... the I think one of the best stories about that, the photo, is each time I see Glenn Hall, who was the St. Louis goalie, he looks at me and he says, is that the only goal you ever scored? <laughs> but the thing, but Bobby, you also say you f you actually find it disrespectful when hockey players celebrate after goals. I don't think it's necessary. Um, um, you see s some guys riding their sticks and so on. I just, again, it's not, I just don't think it's right. Uh, it's not what I would do. And there's a lot of players that don't do it, but uh, um, I just that's that's the way that's the way. I am. Even if it's a, a rookie who just scored its fourth well, goal, I, I gave it a good jump there. Yeah, I mean, there you go. So <laughs> that, the, the, I mean, I mean, I I know you're talking about the kid the other day and out, out west yeah. who had his fourth goal. That, I mean, I, I I I've got to defend the young man. I mean, he's you know he's a young Czech boy. I don't think he he doesn't understand yet. <laughs> he will now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, it was uh, th that was for an All Star game when they do the shootout <laughs> that goal. But uh, uh, he just didn't know. He'll he'll know now. And the guys the, the guys will take him aside and say you, you just don't do that. Uh, let me go back to the beginning. And yep. the first couple of chapters are about you and Parry Sound. Yep. You're playing hockey on a frozen bay or, yep. or river with your friends. It's a recurring image in the book, Bobby. It seems to shape some of your opinions about hockey today. What did you get from playing shinny for hours on end versus the more structured game kids that, play today? I had more fun, uh, and that's what minor sports should be all about. And if you don't mind, I'd like to get back to that because I think we have some issues. Uh, but they were just I was out there with my friends. That's how I learned to play. If you have eight or 10 or 12 on each team, you drop the puck and away you go. You, you better learn to skate. You better learn to handle the puck. That's how, that's how we le learn to play. And we had fun. And in my mind, that's what minor sports is all about. Uh, whether it's baseball, hockey, soccer, minor sports is for fun and recreation for everyone. And not just the elite, for everyone. And that's how it was approached in Perry Sound. My father, people would come up to my father and say, hey, your son's going to be in the NHL. My dad said, fine. And his advice to me was, hey, go out and have fun. We'll see what happens. Well, you were a, a really creative hockey player. You played with with a freedom to be to do what you wanted. And I was allowed to do that. I mean, and that's well. That's, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Would you be? Would you have de developed into the player you are if you were in the minor leagues today? Don't know. <laughs> I, you know, I was owned by the Boston Bruins when I was fourteen. I played for their junior teams. They hired the coaches, and then because when I went to Boston, they they did not ask me to change my style. They thought that was the way I was most effective. And they continue to continue to let me play like that. Today, I would hope that if if uh, I if you look at the teams that are winning, they a lot of them have that uh, offense well, offensive defenseman uh, who right. who creates, moves the puck, jumps up into the play. But and, you say the emphasis today is not on creativity, but on systems. Well, the the, the systems. I mean, even, even the kids are playing the trap, which is outrageous. I mean, that's not how you learn learn to play the game. That's not that's not how you improve your puck handling, your skating, your your hockey skills. We gotta let our kids go and let them let them have fun and let them play. There's too much too much structure. Uh, I really believe that the kids play too much. Uh, I never attended a hockey school until after I turned pro. Uh, now the parents are convinced that their kids have to play 12 months of the year if they're going to make it, which is you know, hogwash. Uh, play other sports, uh, hang around other kids, uh, be instructed by other coaches. I think that's healthier. 
You played baseball. I played baseball. I, I played other sports, and we played hockey in in the, in, in the winter time. And I think that's the healthy thing for kids. Do you have a sense of looking back how that creativity you developed uh, or had and were allowed the freedom to, yeah. to engage in helped you become such a dominant but, hockey player? But, but you know, and I'm I'm often asked, you know, what I think the reason for any success I had. I mean, I had a love and passion for the game that was never taken out of me, and. When I was on the ice with my friends, uh, when I was playing junior hockey, when I was practicing, when I was playing pro, I, you know, I, I always had that love and passion for the game. And look, you have a great passion and love for this business. And if you didn't have it, you wouldn't do the job. You well, I had be, a great passion for hockey too, but yeah. I was getting clobbered by the time I was 16, <laughs> so I stopped playing. But that's that's what parents have to understand. The chances of your son being the next one are, are, are pretty slim. I mean, point zero zero two five or some percent of all kids ever playing hockey ever play one game in the NHL so parents have to keep that in, keep that in mind but I never had that love and passion taken out of me right. ever and and I and you see some minor sports they an outrageous coach or parents screaming yelling at their kids leaving the leaving the building so the, the one thing I can guarantee parents if, if if your son or daughter has an ability to play a sport and if they keep that love and passion for the game They'll have it. They'll like. They'll get a chance. I guarantee it. They'll get a chance. Someone will find them and give them a chance yeah. to, to to move up. By you putting. You don't have to manufacture it. By you putting pressure on them and playing twelve months a year, it, it's not helping. It's not helping. And just let the kid. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Mm. <laughs> let's let's just relax. Let's let our kids play. Let's let them develop. Let's let them grow up. You see some guys that that aren't drafted, never been drafted, became stars in our game. Late bloomers. Cam Neely couldn't play for Vancouver. Uh, yeah, I think Vancouver. Uh, he comes to Boston and, hello, Hall of Famer. <laughs> so Phil Esposito, uh, Stanfield, and Hodge couldn't play in Chicago, but they could play in Boston. So, hey, everyone relax, slow down, let the kids develop. And not only will they have to develop their skills, they have to develop mentally. They have to grow up, so give them time. You were only 14 mm -hmm. when you first signed with the Boston Bruins in 62 mm -hmm. by way of the Oshawa Generals. Mm -hmm. Did you know you were going to make the NHL? No. No, I never. When did you know? When did when you, they told when me did you... to, when they told me to go back to Boston to finish training camp? At, we used to train in London, Ontario, and um, as camp went on, and back then we trained like for five and six weeks. We didn't play like they do today, and players would soon be called into the general manager's office, and they'd be sending them to the different farm teams. And I was waiting for my call. I was called in. They told me to go back to Boston, finish training camp. And when I got back to Boston, I had a different sweater at my seat, so I knew I was playing uh, opening night. But, but again, I, I'll, I was just, I was just, I was, I was where I was the happiest. I was like, you're behind that mic. You love being behind your mic. I and do. when I was on the ice, I just loved being on the ice. And I never thought all I all I wanted to do was go out every night and do my very best. And you weren't. I mean, unlike maybe a lot of young kids, uh, hockey players today, you you weren't waiting by the phone for a phone call from the lease at the age of twelve or something. Yeah. You, you 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 were. Who do you think is responsible for fostering unrealistic NHL career aspirations among young people today? Is it the parents? Is it oh, the coaches? Absolutely. Parents will. The, the one thing that should be asked before before the begin beginning of every minor sports season, whether, whatever sport it may, you know. You know, what are your goals for that season? And I really truly believe you know, the number one goal should be to help develop better people by teaching good values. And, and, and while you're teaching good values, teach the fundamentals of the sport. Mm. Just that's, that's all you have to do. Let the kids play. Let them have fun. You know, if, if coaches and officials on the ice and parents in the stands and those folks that run the leagues, they have to work together to make sure it's a great experience for every kid. And and, if, and and shame on us if you don't do that. That's that's our responsibility. We, we I say to my kid, you're responsible for this. You're responsible for that. Yeah. Well, think about the responsibility that that coach, that official on the ice who should control what goes on on the ice. That parent in the stand should act like they should act like ladies and gentlemen. And that person running the league, he should have rules within his league. You want to be the president of the league? Darn it, you have rules and make sure it's a great experience for every kid. Or darn it, you shouldn't be there. These are our kids, for God's sake. They, we don't have any control what goes on at the NHL level. We're supposed to have some control what right. goes on in our kids' programs. You're passionate about this. Um, yes, yeah. I think it's. I mean, I not mean, just I, about the game, but I, about. I mean, but by by developing better kids and instilling good values and teaching good fundamentals, it's going to be better for the for the for the game down the road. Get back to your story. You were, you were 18 when you played your first season with the Bruins. I, I mean, it's one thing to win a spot on a team. It's it's quite another to realize that you were becoming a star. 
At what point did that become apparent never, to you? Never crossed my mind. All I know, I was, I was playing. I, I played well enough in camp. Uh, they invited me back to Boston. I'm in the starting lineup, and you know, as time went on, I mean, it, it, I, I was starting to feel more comfortable in 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 training camp. And we played some exhibition games. So I was feeling more comfortable, and I was starting to feel, you know, maybe I can play here. And then when they they called me in and you know said you go back to Boston, you you finish training camp and play in the opening night. Hmm, this is great. <laughs> but when you were Bobby in the first in the years after that, when you were thrust into the spotlight, yeah. how did you deal with that? Um, well, I was I was I didn't go far. I mean, I was you know I I I, I mean I spoke to the press and I went out in public, but I. You know, I I didn't feel that if I did a whole bunch of things that I could perform properly. I mean, uh, there was a lot of things I could have done, but I knew I knew me. Uh, I knew that I had to rest. I knew it was expected of me. Uh, I know what I expected of me. I had a level that I that I wanted to play at every night, and I had a level that I that I knew they expected me to play at, and 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 that's. That's what I thought about. I didn't think about being a star. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, I, I wanted I wanted to be ready to play at my level. As you know, you have a level you, you report at. That's the level. I mean, everybody has a different level. You know, I've talked to players and they say, "Well, I can't play at your level. I don't I don't expect you to play at my level." But you have a level, mm -hmm. and that's one of the only thing that bothers me this year uh, in in the league is you see players that. It's one thing about Sid. He's got a level and he plays it now. Y'all can't play at Sidney Crosby's level. You know, you're under here, but play at your level and play consistently at your level. And and you see a player that should be playing at a certain level and tonight you see him and say, wow, tomorrow night you see him. What, was that the same guy? That's the only thing that bothers me. Money doesn't bother me. Nothing bothers me about the game. It's just a consistent play or lack of consistent play from some of the players. I'm trying to figure that out. So if somebody says, I want to be the best, you, t you want them to be the best that they can that be. That they can be. Not and, necessarily and, and You're not going to be Sidney Crosby. You're going to play at your best level and, and play there consistently. And, 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 and that's the only thing that bothers me to see players that don't play uh, consistently at, at, at their level. I'm speaking with Bobby Orr. His book, Orr, My Story, is out in bookstores today, The Hockey Legend. Is it true that after after games you hid in the trainer's room because you wanted to, <laughs> the press to focus on your teammates? Well, Honestly. I, 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 I wasn't a big press guy. Uh, I would go in the trainer's room. But don't forget, Derek Sanderson liked to talk to the press. <laughs> Phil liked to talk to the press. So they were they were great to play with. Not only were they great players, they loved to talk to the press. That was your trick. <laughs> Still take it off my skates. Talk to Derek. Uh, well, I, Bobby, I, I can talk about all the accomplishments, but I, I guess what a lot of people might not realize as vividly, and you, you really see it in the book, is the amount of pain you endured, even in some of your best mm -hmm. years with your knee issues. How did increasing knee troubles affect your sense of confidence playing the game? You know, I, you know, I, you know, pressure. I never, people often talk to me about pressure. I didn't feel any pressure at all playing until I couldn't do what I once did. I couldn't play the way I once did. That's when I started. And, and I think w when you're under pressure, you're, you're worried, you're, you don't sleep, you, you know, you just everything's going uh, wacky. Uh, it, and it wasn't really until I, until I couldn't do what I once did. And then, if that's pressure, the pressure started to bother me, and, and that's when it started to bother me. With the knee injury, once that puck was dropped, it's funny with professional athletes, once the puck was dropped, you know, it was, it was gone. Uh, right. Any pain I, pain I had, most, the most trouble I had was following games after games, so a when lot you, of icing and so on. When you think about the final years with the knee trouble, and by the way, you're just in your late 20s at that point, yeah. you're not even very old. Do you think of them positively, or do you, is is there is it bittersweet to think about? Oh, no, them? I mean, I my only regret is I wish I could have played longer. But you know, but I have, I, I played a style that that. And hey, look, we're a, we're a tough game. We have big, fast, strong players, and and it's a contact game. And and certainly my style didn't help my problems. I I had the puck a lot, and I was hit a lot. So, but that's the way I played, and and. Uh, you know, the only regret I have is that I just obviously I wish I could have played a little longer. I I was interviewed by a, a um, CBS guy last week, and he says, "Were you a puck hawk?" <laughs> <laughs> I said to him, "I said, well, I had to puck a little bit, so maybe I was a puck hawk." But no, I I I didn't feel pressure or 
you know, I didn't start warring till I couldn't play like I once did. In retrospect, there's that, it's painful to watch that press conference where you talk about in 1978, you're 30 years old and you say, I, I can't play yeah. anymore. Uh, what's the hardest part of looking back at that time now? Um, I mean, just having to, to sit there and, you know, they're taking your skates from you, you're finished. Uh, you can't do what, what you've done your entire life. Uh, you can't do what you just love to do. Uh, and it was very difficult. And probably the most difficult thing was, you know, I had to go to work. I was still 28. Uh, things weren't going that well uh, financially. Uh, I had to go to work. And uh, uh, I said, oh, my God, uh, I never looked at hockey as work. I said, my God, work. What do you do? <laughs> so that that was probably the most uh, difficult thing is is realizing, hey, I, I've got work to do here. And uh, but we'll, we'll go back to the kids. The very things that I learned as a kid, those values that we talked about: being responsible, being respectful. Uh, you're going to work with teammates. You know, these are things that you can teach the kids. Uh, you're going to work hard. If you work hard, things can happen. You have to make sacrifices. I started approaching my business the same way as I approached my game. And these are the values, the things that we right. teach our kids early on. When you say I wasn't doing that well financially, mm -hmm. I mean, that comes as a shock to people. You, you're, you're the best player in the game, and, and, and there's a big contract. So you do spend some time in this book on Alan Eagleson. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not really going to ask you about him because yeah. I know that it's... I'm, uh, I'm fine. I'm yeah. fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to talk about it. But, but, but basically, it's a, you know, this horrible, uh, and people can see it in the book, this horrible relationship with, this, with your agent that, goes, that, that, that is deleterious to you in your career. If, if, let me ask you this. What is the lesson... That you take from that. Pay attention, and, and we and I talk to the kids. I mean, I, I had a guy who was like a brother, trusted him, believed in him. People tried to tell me. I told him to get away from me. Uh, he's my my guy, and I trust him. And, uh, and it turns out, obviously, that you know he wasn't doing the right thing. And it wasn't just me. I mean, look what he did to the other players through international hockey. The players that he was representing. I mean, he was stealing from them, and there was pension funds and insurance funds. I mean, it's outrageous what this man, what this man was doing. Uh, you know, he was stripped of his Order of Canada. He's out of the Hall of Fame, disbarred. Uh, people think that, that, the, that my problems were in, that, the, in his charges. Uh, not at all. I didn't have anything to do with that. Uh, one, all I wanted to do was get away from the man. Uh, two, I didn't have the money to hire a lawyer. It took the U.S. government over uh, almost five years to get him to come to the United States to face face charges. So uh, he was a very powerful man in Canada. And, and my understanding is, is that he's also been pardoned here in Canada, which is outrageous. But uh, that's what I understand. 30 seconds left with you here. The, um, one of the reasons you don't read your press, you've always said, is you're more self-critical of yourself than anybody else could be. Correct. You've been immortalized. You, 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 are you, can you... Be a little less self-critical at this point, looking back on your career. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to be humble. My God, I'm, I'm as, you know, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't need writers to tell me if I played poorly or, or played well. I, I was very critical of myself when I played, and, and again, you were asking earlier about the book. I, I hope it, I hope people read it and get something from it. Great pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Nice being with you, Bobby Orr. Back in just a minute.